Greetings and salutations, my guildlings. Colespire here with my first official response to a video here on YouTube. It's one that I had hoped that I would never have to do because I believed this woman was long gone from the world of attacking video games. Anita Sarkeesian has graced the world with her newest video titled Tropes First Women, Woman as Reward. I honestly couldn't believe this came up in my feed. After her last two debacles with her strong female characters being so well accepted, I especially loved the one where she said the character was such a strong female character, even though you couldn't tell she was female, didn't talk to anyone, and then sacrificed herself at the end of the game. And that was the best example of a playable female hero. This Tropes series has been way overdue for going on what? Almost three years now? After she garnered enough attention and support that her Kickstarter gave her $160,000 to complete it? A task, mind you, that she assured her supporters would not actually cost her anything extra to make. She just wanted to get support, i.e. money, from everyone else so she didn't have to fit the bill anymore. So how does she start this video off? By showing a camera taking a picture of cleavage, of course. Then says the video shows scenes of graphic and sexual nature. It already has my blood flowing from the mere whisper of sex, being a male and not having control over my urges and all. I'm not going to go step by step over this video, because there are enough people out there that are doing that. But what I am going to do is just point out some fallacies and some bullet points that this con artist actually believes. Well, more likes want, wants you to believe. First and foremost, she brings up Samus Aran and the original Metroid game. This is a classic game that is one half of a coin term that created a genre of video games that we all know and love, Metroidvania. The term is used to describe a side-scrolling game that allows you to explore everything right away. Kind of like The Legend of Zelda, in the fact that every section of the game is open for you to explore at your own peril. Now, Metroid has an Easter egg. Two, in fact. And each one is linked with how fast you can beat the game. If you beat the game in under three hours, not only were you treated with a mind-blowing experience of realizing that the main character that was so shrouded in mystery and was this badass bounty hunter was a woman, but you got to see her without the suit in a leotard. The pixelated sex only got better from there, my friends. If you beat the game in under an hour, which is no easy task, mind you, you are greeted with the reveal of Samus being a woman along with her in a bikini. Wow. Just gets my blood pumping just thinking about it. I need to talk about this as if it were the biggest thing in the world, that this is all the players played this game for. Samus as a reward? No, I think not. Yes, the bikini and leotard images are there, but they're, are they object, objectifying Samus? One could argue that the reward was already given in so much as that you beat the game in a single sitting. That was the reward, not Samus in a bikini. It isn't like she is striking a pose, showing her ass, and blowing kisses at the screen. She just stands there and waves. In later games, she even tosses her hair. Forgive me for not clutching my pearls. There's a huge issue of this being taken out of context, along with every other example in this series, let alone this installment. In 1986, when Metroid was released, the NES was still seen as a kid's toy. But Metroid was pushed as a game for older kids, teens to be exact. This technically could be considered one of the first M-rated games, or at least T. I know there are others out there for the Atari, but we won't get into those because those weren't part of the example in this video that she put out. The difficulty and expansiveness of Metroid could not be compared to Super Mario Bros. in challenge because there was no comparison. 
This game was geared towards an older crowd, and in doing so, the programmers added a little something for the better than average player, which, by the way, in 1986, was almost 95% male. So, that explains the context of Metroid a little better, but let's move on to another old school game she decided to lambast as a sexist woman as reward piece of trash. Double Dragon. Now, she touched on Double Dragon before in the multi-part Useless Damsels in Distress episodes, and that was once again shown for the stupidity that it was. But this time, well, she takes on the ending. One year after the release of Metroid, we got the side-scrolling beat-em-up that became a staple in the genre. 1987 was still in the same vein of mainly male gamers, and this game had an actual story that tried to draw you in as simplistic as it was. Yes, Metroid had a story too, but this one had a little bit more. Marion, girlfriend of Billy Lee, is kidnapped, and you take control of Billy Lee to try and save her. According to Sarkeesian, this game should have ended there, though, since Marion should be capable enough of as a fictional character to save herself from the gangs that took her, and Billy should just sit at home and wait. Fun game, right? You know, he sits there, continues to look at the phone, then at the door, and you hit A to have him fall asleep. Thankfully, the developers didn't follow that bullshit and gave us a pretty good flushed out game. The enemies were tough and needed some strategy to defeat, and you could also plug in a second controller to let your friend play too. You know, video games as a game. It's a strange concept, I know. Not to spoil an almost 30-year-old game, but in the end, you find out that Jimmy Lee, Billy's brother, is the one who kidnapped Marion, and you actually have to fight him to save her. That was a real twist at the end of the game, and in the context that Anita would like you to believe, Marion will just fall for whomever rescues her. The reveal at the end of a single-player game is good. It was a shock to most players. But, what the creators did was something simple. If you played with two players from start to finish, as Billy Lee and Jimmy Lee, you still find out that Jimmy kidnapped Marion, and now he wants to fight you for her. So it actually becomes a battle between two brothers. One wants to save his girlfriend from his twisted brother, and the other wants to keep her all for himself. Jimmy is still the bad guy. Yet, if you go off of what Anita says, it's just two guys fighting over a girl, and the winner gets the kiss. She then talks about sex as a reward, and uses one example of Ride to Hell Retribution. Really? That was the best you could come up with? Ride to Hell? One of the worst games ever made? The one that almost broke Angry Joe? Yes, the woman you save in the game rewards you with sex. Awkward sex. Awkward clothed sex with animations that harken back to the hot coffee mod from Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. And I agree, taken out of context as she's been doing for most of the video series, this is horrible. But, think of the game she chose. A game where you play as an outlaw biker running drugs, guns, and all sorts of illegal operations. Take Sons of Anarchy, and how awesome that show was, get rid of the good acting, great story, and all substance, and you have Ride to Hell Retribution. In the world of outlaw biker gangs, the women that are known are as biker bitches. These women are passed around like candy from a Pez dispenser. It doesn't make it right, but that is how these women show their status, who, have they, who they have slept with, how many they have slept with, and who they are sleeping with now. Ride to Hell, in its own crappy way, was trying for realism. This is all besides the point, though. She chose a horrible example from a hor horrible game that even people who play video games know to stay away from. It has one of the worst gamer scores in history. Bad example after bad example after bad example. How could it get any worse? Well, let's talk about Sid Meier's Pirates. She did, and she glanced over one important piece of evidence. The whole marrying daughters and, and the girls being worth more if they were pretty. 
that's how it really was. The more beautiful the daughter, the higher the dowry the father could get for her. Holy crap. This was a simulation adventure game that was trying to give you the real experience of being a pirate. It was the best we could do in 2004. The daughters didn't have personalities or even names at some point because they weren't the focus of the game. They were a way to boost your stats, not a reward. In essence, they're a item that you can equip in like in any role playing game. You didn't stay at home as a pirate with your new wife and have a bunch of kids. You married her, probably sold her off for gold, and then went on your merry way. Pirates, people tend to forget, were outlaws. They were wanted. They were criminals. They were not like Jack Sparrow and Hector Barbosa from the imaginations of Disney. Pirates were horrible people that would rather kill you as much as look at you. They killed innocent people when they overtook ships, stole from governments, and raised hell whenever they made port. The modern day equivalent would be, well, pirates. The Somali pirates we heard about a few years ago, yeah, they're a real thing and pirates still exist. This is another example of her taking a single part of a game and making the whole game about it. It's like taking Monkey Island and having it be about solving that first puzzle and that's a, that it. That's it. This was a small part of Sid Meier's Pirates, but if you take Anita's word for it, this was all the game was about. Marrying daughters and getting stuff for it. Kind of like saving a naked slave girl in Conan the Barbarian, or the threesome minigames in God of War. Yeah, she glanced over these, but used them as an example by showing you that you get experience for having sex. Saying that the game teaches you, as the player, that this is all women are for. I keep saying the term out of context, and I know you're probably tired of hearing it, but once again, that is what's going on here. Saving the slave girl in Conan is optional. If you want the extra experience, and want to hear the girl throw herself at you for saving her, by all means, go for it, but you don't have to. On top of that, this is Conan the Barbarian. Has she never seen the movies or read the comics that it came from? Naked Slave Girls was kind of quid pro quo. They were there because they were there. She doesn't get it. And it continues on when she talks about God of, God of War. The major point that Anita missed is this. The sequences are optional. In the first game of God of the God of War series, you can walk right out of the room and never look at the two naked girls again. In the second game, you act to have to actually actively find the minigame to participate in it. And in the third game, the woman, the goddess of love, Aphrodite, is the one that initiates it, and you can still turn her down. Yes, all of these give you experience points, and all of them are little nods to Greek mythology, but they're optional and can be avoided completely if you're offended by the content like that. And then my be question becomes this, if you're offended by that, why the hell are you even playing them? Both God of War and Conan the Barbarian were extremely violent, gory, and over-the-top games. Why did you buy them? Why did you rent them? Why did you even put them into your system? It's mind-boggling. And then we get to Grand Theft Auto. My god, this series is the whipping boy for these types of people, apparently. Anita tells us that gamers are encouraged to use hookers to refill their health and increase their stamina. Holy crap. It, did she never play this game, or what? You know, we have the picture of her sitting next to these giant stacks of video games, and Grand Theft Auto is in them, along with God of War and some pretty violent games like Halo. I, I don't understand. 
she must not have played them, and she just took the picture for bragging rights? Yes, having sex with hookers can increase your stamina in the game and refill your health. So you can do things like run faster for longer periods of time or ride a bike at higher speeds to complete the mini games that are geared towards those. And some of them are not optional, they're actually part of the game. But what she doesn't tell you is this. You can do those activities and raise the stamina anyway. I can tell you with 100% certainty that you don't need to have sex with any hookers in GTA if you don't want to. How do I know this, you may ask? Because in my many playthroughs, I never touched them. I never did the have sex with a hooker and then kill them to get your money back because I was never encouraged to do it. I, it was never part of the game unless you wanted it to be. I never touched them. And surprise, surprise, my stamina grew just out of the use of the run button and riding a bike and swimming. Holy shit, woman, I understand you want to prove a point. But at least make it a legitimate one. Anyway. After all this is said and done. Anita talks about trophyism and male entitlement. This is where I had to stop watching. My bullshit meter had reached its limits. I could not finish. But knowing I was going to do something like this, I had to finish watching. So on a second watch through, or a second watching, I actually was able to finish. And I wish I hadn't. Xbox and PlayStation gives trophies for accomplishments in video games. It triggers that little pleasure sensor in our brain that makes us happy when we accomplish something and makes us want to do it again. Hey, you completed this level. Bing! Upper right hand corner, you get a trophy. Without getting too much into it, Anita tells us that these achievements are just preparing us males for a life of sexism and misogyny. Because we get achievements for scoring with the ladies, we are led to believe that this is the ultimate goal in the real world as well. You know, score with as many chicks as possible and then at the end of your life you can compare STDs with your buddies to see who got the most tail. Yeah! That's what we want. These trophies and gamer credits are giving us a sense of entitlement over women, women's bodies because we can so freely do this stuff in the games we play we just expect it when we go to a bar or club in real life. I don't know a single person who puts any credit into their gamer score. On PlayStation Network, you get this you get this little thing that's a level. I don't I don't know about Xbox cuz I don't own one, but I know you get gamer tags as well. I don't know anybody who goes around as a gamer and starts bragging about I'm a level 27 on PSN or I'm a level 50 on Xbox Live I don't know a single person who does that and I'm not talking about the actual gamer levels in like Call of Duty when you have a high level in Call of Duty it means something it means you've played that game enough but I don't know anybody who uses their gamer tags and their gamer levels as bragging rights do you see why my bullshit meter went nuts she is basically saying that men have no cognitive agency we are just walking rape machines that are programmed by what we play and see even if we know it's wrong, we're still going to do it because we feel entitled to use women's bodies as we see fit because media, movies, television, and games told us so. We're men, damn it.
not only is that insulting to the males of the species, but it's even more so to the females. You are being told by the poster child of feminism that you're worth nothing. You are just a victim waiting for a predator. And I can't agree with that. I've met pickup artists that just want tails, so they go trolling for it at bars and clubs where inhibitions are their loosest. In the same breath, I have known women that see bars and clubs as prime hunting ground for dick in a good time. Both sexes have the ability to be assholes. But in the same light, I know more men who want a relationship, so they stay away from bars, clubs, raves, and all those places where you can get a one night stand and an STD. They actually appreciate the people they find interest in, and I know women who are the same way. There are still no links between video games and sexism. Just like there are still no links between video games and violence. This is just the same tired Jack Thompson, Thompson diatribe, only now it's packaged in a pretty pink and blue flannel bow with a pretty face behind it. People believe this crap and it really makes me question the common sense of the world. And then I look at people from Tumblr and realize our world is doomed. Tropes vs. Women, Woman as Reward is just another attempt to push the narrative that gaming is filled with men who hate women and want them out of their boys club. It has taken multiple instances of video games and placed them out of context to said games and used it as an example for this so-called male entitlement that is somehow being pushed on every gamer out there. We are being trained to believe the world of video games is exactly like real life. We are being taught that we can respawn after we die and that all we have to do is rescue the girl and she'll touch our special place. Only we're not. This woman this con artist wants this crap taught in schools. Not because she actually believes any of the shit that spews from her mouth, but because she wants the money that comes from a government agency purchasing her content. That's the rub, people. That is why she is doing so much to push the narrative that gamers can't tell the difference between fantasy and reality, and that we need to protect our children from these games. Do not let this fearmonger do this to your kids. Stop listening to what she has to say and think about what she is actually saying. She just wants you to listen and believe, whereas common sense should dictate you listen and question and verify. I don't know if she actually believes the crap that she spews. I'd like to say that she does, but here's an interesting point. In every single instance that she is on TV, or at a speech, except for one, she has talking points. She has a speech written for her. She does not talk for herself. And the one instance that it, she did not have a written reply ready was the Colbert Report on Comedy Central. And that is, to this day, the only video on YouTube from Comedy Central that has the comments and the rating disabled. This is why I think she doesn't believe what she says. She gives us all of these problems that she sees, but she does not give us a solution. And she has yet to give us a solution. Why? Because she doesn't care. She just wants you to pay for her content.
And that's it for me. This has been my first response. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for listening, everybody. If you liked what I had to say, please support the channel by subscribing and hitting that thumbs up button. If you think I'm an idiot, say so in the comments below. You can follow me on Facebook and Twitter with the links below in the low bar. And my name is Cole Spire, and please be good to yourself and to others. Have a good night, everybody.